Hello, welcome to Release Our Wings. We have with us today, for your enlightenment, our brother Ken O'Donnell, who's the coordinator of the Brahma Kumaris for all of South America. He's been a meditator for 38 years, and he really pioneered a lot of our understanding about meditation and how to apply the experiences we have in meditation in order to make our lives really soar and sail and fly. And so we chose this topic today of breaking our limits because we want to um, not be so confined by limits. And Brother Ken has a very interesting perspective on how meditation can actually free us from our self-imposed limits. So welcome, Ken. Thank you for joining us today to talk with us about this topic. Yeah, it's great to be here, Mary, really. It's, uh, it's a great honor, actually. Mm, good. I was thinking when we first got this topic about um, a person who's always intrigued me because I used to live in San Francisco, right, a few blocks away from where the whole Jamba Juice company started. And so the founder of Jamba Juice, when he was very young, started a business plan. I can't remember what it was for. But he filed for bankruptcy seven or eight times before he finally got a business plan that even worked. But when he got that plan that worked, he from that grew an international company that's extremely successful. And so I've often wondered, I would not have gone through eight bankruptcies. I would have given up and found myself a job. <laughs> so what is it that there are certain areas of our life where people just seem to not see the limits that the rest of us see? I guess it's because there's some drive inside of us that mm. is stronger than the information that's around us. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, it may be for a good thing, it may be for not such a good thing either, you know. The, probably mm -hmm. the mafia has that, so, such a drive <laughs> as well, you know, or the, or the drug lords, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember once I was, um, for six months I used to go every week to a, a maximum security prison in, in Melbourne, in Australia. And of course, in the beginning, I, uh, they were so sort of. When I told them I was here to teach meditation, they, you know, every third word was uh, was a very strong sort of word, you know. Mm. And what the what the so and so are you doing here? And I said to them, "Do you want to learn to meditate?" Because it was maximum security, so they were all murderers or bank robbers or rapists. Most of them for in for twenty years or more. Mm. And of course, they were considered as highly da dangerous. And I said, you know, in the world there are people who live in other sorts of prisons. Most of us do, in a sense. And they're prisons of our own making. Mm. So since you're mm. here, and you're going to be here for a long time, why don't you want to learn to be a little bit free from these... From these because freedom of the mind is nothing to do with physical bars. Mm. And of course that did have some appeal to some of them and about a group of about 25 or 30 became interested so I went there every week. Mm. But it struck me that you know how how there are physical limitations. People have I know a guy who's blind for example he became blind at 15 he comes to one of our centers in Brazil. And it's different from becoming blind at birth, right? Mm-hmm. So, but he, he's, he's got a permanent excuse, if he wants to, for not doing anything. Mm -hmm. He could live sort of off the, off the pity of others easily, mm -hmm. especially from the sort of so-called social class that he's mm -hmm. in. It's quite a good level. But he, he didn't accept any of that. And he finished his study, finished his college, he went to, to university, he went... Uh, he did a master's degree in education and finally a PhD blind mm. and now he's the head of a department in the government that looks after handicapped mm. uh, people and so you could accept mm -hmm. anything as an excuse to stop you from doing something you know he I mean I guess blindness is a little bit more serious than back bankruptcy right mm -hmm. But even then he didn't accept it. So you can accept mm -hmm. the confines, uh, 
you can have a, a sore foot and that can be a permanent mm-hmm. excuse for not walking, right? Right. So it's a, it's a way how you look at yourself and how you right. look at the prison. Yeah. Now I think, I, I understand what you're saying. It's about how I look at myself. But a common expression, which is more how I look at my life, is people say, you can see the glass as half empty or half full. Yeah. So let's say I'm a person who always sees the glass as half empty. What can I do within myself to really change that so I genuinely can not just say the glass is half full, but when I look at a glass, really feel that? Well, most of us have complaints, you know, I don't have enough Mm. time, Uh, nobody helps me, Mm -hmm. traffic's bad, you know, too much work, whatever. Mm -hmm. But every single one of those affirmations is, in fact, an excuse mm. because it's not that I don't have enough time. I, the thing is, I'm not organized mm. or not organized enough. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody helps me. Why? Because I'm I've got such a nasty character that everyone <laughs> who comes to help me, I sort of jump on them. Mm. So the problem is not that people don't cooperate with me because I don't attract the cooperation. Mm. So I have to start looking at the real problem and stop giving excuses mm. first of all um, because it doesn't matter whether the glass is half empty or half full at least I've got a glass mm. you know <laughs> even if it's a, and some water <laughs> yeah, I've got some water and I've got a glass I can do something mm. you know they say make make lemonade out of mm. lemons instead of you know um, screwing your face up mm. because it's too acid Mm-hmm. But, but this is this is the challenge. We have mm-hmm. to stop making excuses mm-hmm. about our lives and about ourselves mm-hmm. and about what's not working. And even if there's one thing that is working, let me concentrate on that. I remember I was in, in Italy uh, with a bunch of people in Bologna. Mm-hmm. And I asked the audience um, if they were special people. So hand up those who think that they are special. Of course, everyone's special, right? There's no one like me, so I'm special, right? Then I ask them, what makes you special? And this old guy about 80, more than 80 years old said, I make great macaroni. (laughs) Why do you do it? He says, because I like to get Mm. people together and serve Mm. them. So that's your speciality, Mm. not the fact that you make great macaroni. Mm. Of course, you... It's spaghetti, it's bolognese, right? right. <laughs> the thing is, the the I have to see what I have as special, mm. independent of the circumstances around me, and then I can start to break down these prisons, which are in fact my own, my beliefs. Mm-hmm. There are physical limitations, but mm-hmm. even then, those physical limitations mm-hmm. don't have to be so limiting. Mm. Now, this group in the prison, we really explored the depths of meditation, they became such a good influence for the rest of the mm. inmates, mm. you know, even though they're not going to get out of there. Mm-hmm. But you, you look out around, people living behind high walls with, with electric fences mm. in some of the countries. Um, they have bodyguards, they, you know, they're afraid mm. of losing something, they're afraid of walking out in the street in the night time some places. Um, it's a reality in many mm. countries. So, you know, I'm surrounded by all of the boogeymen that I <laughs> want to create, mm-hmm. basically. Yeah. Now, this man in Italy, this old man who made macaroni and got people together, he probably didn't have to work hard to develop this speciality of bringing people together. It seems like maybe he had that all of his life. And it seems like sometimes we try to develop expertise or marketable qualities in ourselves when perhaps our real strengths are within us. So how do I look inside of myself? How do I find those real strengths and how do I really value them? Yeah, well, what, what's there is um, something which has always been there, you know. Uh, if I hold on to the things that I have, it's very difficult because one day I have them, the next day yeah. I don't. So if I am so much attracted to doing things, going here, doing this, you know, that that can also change. Um, If I rely on my feelings, it's up and down like a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. But there are some things in me which have always been true. Mm. 
uh, which don't change. I have my value. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter what happens. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the central bank in, in Brazil, I had written a book called uh, Values in the Workplace. And the, the, the HR person at the central bank asked me to come along to give a talk. And so there was a, there was a, a campaign that they were doing to, to be more careful with the banknotes because they figured that if you are more careful with the way you handle banknotes, then they could save money mm. from not having to reprint mm -hmm. banknotes because it costs money to print money, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I thought this is what I'm going to do. I took a, I was sort of skirting the law, I know, but it was a calculated risk. I made a coloured photocopy of a hundred real <laughs> note, which is about fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. So in the middle of the talk, I bring it out, and it was being on TV because you know I, I figured that they would never know the difference looking at it on TV. Uh, it was to the, all of the units in the country they were televising. I bring it out and say, "Who wants this?" I'm feeling very generous today. Put <laughs> about six or seven, put their hand up, and if I screw it up. Mm. Still want it? And they said, yeah. Then I threw it on the floor and jumped on it. And I, I picked it up, <laughs> opened it out. You still want it? And then the last blasphemy, I took the note and ripped it in half. <laughs> you still want it? And they said, yes. We can change it at the central bank. <laughs> so, so, so the message was, I, I said, I would never do this to a real note, of course. But the message is, it doesn't matter what I, what I did mm. with this note, it still had the same mm. value. So in the same way, I have a value that I need to discover through meditation. And it doesn't matter mm. if the world screws me up, if the world jumps on me, if the world tears me in half, mm. I continue to have the same value. Mm. So it seems to me that if I went through this process of meditation and really tapped into my own value, that I wouldn't have to compete with anybody, I wouldn't have to get respect for anybody, and perhaps I could even help other people recognize their own value. Does, has that been your experience in experimenting with this in your own yeah, life? Yeah, definitely. As our sense of self-value mm. diminishes, the barriers seem to increase. Mm. Mm. Uh, you know, the imagined barriers, most of them, you know, 97% of our worries never really happen. Mm. So only 3% mm. of the time, fear is good when it's warning us of something. You know, that, that instinctive fear is okay, mm -hmm. but 97% of our fears are irrational. Mm -hmm. So we create sort of barriers for ourselves and mm -hmm. hurdles for ourselves and obstacles for ourselves. You know, the word, when I say this person is really difficult, what I'm saying, in fact, is I'm not able to, mm. to mm -hmm. tolerate that person, you know. So instead of looking at, at the outside world, I have to look at my own value. Mm -hmm. Self-respect is, first of all, understanding my value, and, uh, and then through meditation, through getting more power from the source, I'm able to bring that self-respect, mm. and automatically the barriers start to sort of dissolve. Mm. Thank you, Ken. This is very enlightening that actually I don't have to break the barrier. I simply find my barrier, my own value and then the barriers just dissolve, which is really what we all want is for life to be easy and give us an opportunity to soar. So I hope everyone can use their meditation today to go within yourself, find your own value, love it, appreciate it, and show it to the world.